You awake tonight, Emerson? Good, good. Well, we are looking tonight at, of course, this uh, Revelation chapter 4-2, although we're going to be looking inductively at much of what it teaches tonight. We saw the four times that John says in the book of Revelation, I was in the spirit, or in the concept there now, John sees something in the spiritual realm that we presently can't see. We can see it by faith, and that's what God has given these portions of Scripture for us uh, in the Word of God, especially the book of Revelation and the future prophecies. We look at these things and we know with assurity that this is what will happen in heaven. And of course, much of what we see in chapter 4 is taking place in heaven. And we see these seals beginning to be opened. They're opened in heaven, as we said this morning, and the effects of that opening happens on earth. The church is in heaven, glorified believers standing around the throne of God. And the first thing that John reveals to us is that uh, God is on his throne. He sees the throne of God in heaven. And he tries to describe it uh, the best that he can with terms that he thought everyone would be acquainted with. And of course, that's by the inspiration of God. So here, the throne of God in Revelation 4.2 is the judicial throne of God. And this leads us to two things. Somewhere along the line in your life, we know this. Your sin has to be paid for. It has already been judged. Right? We, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So for every one of us born into the world, our sin has already been judged. And the wages of that sin is death. So we are destined to an eternal separation from God just by the fact that we are born children and descendants of Adam. For, one by, for by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So death is passed upon all for all of sin. Of course, we all have a sin nature. That problem poses a serious problem. And so the judicial throne of God is God's uh, action upon this throne is determined by what people have done with Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so he's going to, he sets upon that throne. There are two actions of God upon that throne. It's a judicial throne. One, of course, is the, it becomes the mercy seat and the throne of grace for those who are saved. For those who reject Jesus Christ, it continues to be the throne of judgment, and the white throne will be their destiny. So that is what we see here in this text, this judicial throne of God. And as we look upon this judicial throne of God, and, and we we'll have to understand its context. The context is God is going to judge the nations of the world. All those who, at, only at the beginning of the tribulation, there will be no saved people on earth at all. Not one single saved person will be left on earth. So everybody on earth will be lost and God will begin. And once it begins, remember, it's going to go. There's no stopping it. What begins will go, the full, full destiny of what we find in these seven seal judgments. So, either you are saved and your judgment has been taken care of one place, or you're lost and your judgment's going to be taken care of another place. But your judgment must be taken care of. And so we're going to be focusing tonight mainly on the biblical doctrine of propitiation. Because I think it connects to the a uh, judicial act of God in the judgment of sin in the body of Jesus Christ vicariously. Your sin and my sin. So we're looking at a lot of scripture tonight regarding those things. And we're going to start off in Romans chapter 6 verse 22. We want you to go over there. Now remember, Romans chapter 6 is a chapter that is developing the practical sanctification of the believer. It's not a salvation verse. We, we make it a salvation verse, but it does relate to our salvation. What it's talking about is how our salvation then turns to fruit of holiness in our life. 
And that, of course, is through yielding to the Spirit of God, which he's already dealt with in verses 11 through 13 of Romans chapter 6. So verse 22 here, and I, I think probably let's have or just stand out of respect for God's word if you're able. And we're going to read this with the context, but this is really the outcome of the propitiation of God. Because your sin nature has been judged with Jesus Christ, Romans chapter 6, 6. Now, Romans 6, 22 becomes a practicality. It says, now, being free from sin. What is sin here? Are you free from ever sinning again? That's not what it's talking about. Being, being made free from sin. We're no longer slaves to the sin nature. And that is a context. And become servants to God. You have fruit unto holiness in the end of everlasting life. For the wages of sin, that is a concept of living in the sin nature, is death. It's a death here in this context of spiritual life. Now you are born dead to spiritual life when you were born into this world, but even after you're saved, you're dead to spiritual life if you don't learn to yield to the Spirit of God. That's the context here. For the wages of sin is death to spiritual life, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is walking in the newness of life that's available to you uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. So the gift of God is eternal life. Not pie in the sky, but right now. Eternal life right now. That is the God life, it's the Christ life right now. It's yours. And that is all directly connected to the fact that God has been propitiated and his wrath has been satisfied. Father, as we look at all these other portions of Scripture tonight, you have given us so many texts on this subject. We pray you'd open our heart and our understanding to these great truths. Not just that we might know them, for they are important that, for that purpose, but that we might teach them to others also. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Now let's come back to the Gospel of John. We'll look at a couple of verses here, one in chapter 9, another one in chapter 12. But remember, we're looking at the throne of God as a judicial uh, issue of God's sovereignty, his judgment. It's a place of judgment. Your sins have to be judged. Now, they have been judged, but uh, the, the concept is there is a penalty for that judgment, and that penalty will be meted out at the great white throne, or it's been meted out at the cross of Calvary. And so he says here in verse 39 of John 9, and Jesus said, for what? Judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. Now these were the Jews who had been given the law, but they rejected the Messiah and the law. They re rejected the seed that Paul talked about in Galatians 3.16, not the seed as a many, but the seed as one, which is Christ Jesus. They saw the seed, which was in Abraham, and they thought they were the sons of God because they were children of Abraham. But Paul clarifies that very, uh, very astutely in Galatians chapter 3. And so they had rejected that. And so now, because they had rejected that, God had uh, given them over uh, to this reprobate mind of unbelief because they should have seen the Christ in, in the Bible uh, and because the Spirit of God would have taught them. But he said, for Christ, for, Christ said, for judgment I am come into this world. Now that's twofold, right? Twofold is that he would bear the judgment of God. Second, he would become the judge for those who reject him. Do you realize that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus Christ was either bearing your sin in his body and God was judging that sin in the body of Jesus Christ and paying the judge, penalty of that judgment, or at the very same time through all history, Jesus Christ was bearing judgment upon all of those who would reject him. For it is the same instrument. The cross either bears judgment, which to the remission of our sin penalty, or it affirms that sin penalty. 
There's only, those are the only two options. Now come to chapter 12, verse 31. And Christ is now talking about his time of coming to the crucifixion. And he says now, his, because he was in the world right now, so now is the judgment of this world. What's he talking about? He would seal the destiny of the world, all those who reject, re reject him, at the very same place he would redeem. So the cross is both uh, instruments. It is an instrument of redemption for all those who we believe, and it is an I instrument of absolute judgment upon the world for all those who, who reject him. Now the long suffering of God is waiting for all that happen, and at any point and any time those people can repent and come and receive the judgment of their sins. But if they don't, they'll receive the judgment of this world. So he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. You see, that's what Jesus Christ did on the cross of Calvary. He took the sting of death. And so Paul can laugh in the face of Satan. He says, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is the law, but the, but the strength of sin, uh, the sting of death is, is, is sin, but the strength of sin is the law. And he says, God's already given me, praise God, that he has already given me victory through Jesus Christ. So, verse 32, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me, and he has done that. Then in Galatians 3.13, this great chapter of the seed chapter of Scripture. And Paul is explaining here to these Jews who are being led astray back to the Mosaic Covenant. Now he's explaining that you're not saved by being descendants of Abraham. Unless you're a descendant of the seed of Abraham, which is the faith of Abraham, which faith was in the seed, which is Christ. The same thing in Romans chapter 9. Not seeds as of many, but seeds as one which is Christ. Galatians 3, 13. But in Romans chapter 9, there Paul says, Not all the Jews are saved, but they are the, those who are saved. Those who are true Israel are they who are of the promise. What is that? That's the promised seed, which is Jesus Christ. So here in verse 13, he says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. How did he do that? Being made a curse for us. For it is written, Curseth every one that hangeth on a tree. Christ was cursed in our place. He took our curse in his body on the tree. Now you're going to go on the rest of that chapter in some pretty meaty uh, explanation of all of that. And I encourage you to read it. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 26. Hebrews 9 26. The verses are up here, but I like to hear the pages turn in your Bibles. He says, now, now he's talking to these Jews who were professing to be Christians, but they were thinking about going back to the temple. Going back to live under the Mosaic Covenant, continue offering sacrifices and, and be under the Old Testament priesthood rather than being priests themselves of, of God, the, the New Covenant. They're thinking about going back to the Old Covenant. And uh, here, the writer of the book of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul, uh, is admonishing them that if they don't continue, it is showing that they never understood the gospel. And that is a doctrine of propitiation. We have so little understanding of the doctrine of propitiation today. People pray the prayer without understanding the propitiation of God. People get baptized without understanding the propitiation of God. People join churches without understanding it. And the point is, you should understand it so you can explain it. So Paul says in verse 26, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, in the age, uh, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. What is he talking about? Putting away the judgment that comes from sin. How did he put it away? By taking it in his body on the tree and satisfying God's wrath for it. First uh, Peter chapter 2. Another text. Now again, Peter is writing primarily to Jewish believers. Hebrews, Pete, the, the two epistles of Peter and Jude. And, and uh, of course, some even believe James 
are all uh, epistles written primarily to Jewish believers. Uh, and, and here is one of those, but now it applies to all of us. But the problems were that were applicable that they are addressed in these epistles are primarily to Jewish believers. So here, what's he explain? He explains the propitiation of God by Jesus Christ. It says in verse 22, who, who Jesus, who did no sin. First of all, he was sinless. He was impeccable. He, he did not sin and could not sin. Uh, neither was guile found in his mouth. Not even that was found in him. Who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. He didn't hang on the cross and curse everyone. He certainly could have. He didn't do that. When he suffered, he threatened not. He could have, but he didn't. Can you imagine what would have happened on Jesus uh, on the cross of Calvary if Jesus would have said, okay, this is enough of this, and uh, I'm all done with this, and you, you people that uh, did, are doing what you're doing, you're going to pay for it right now. No. Oh. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. He threatened not. And then we have the but in this text. But committed himself to him, that's the son committing to the father, that judgeth righteously. God was going to judge your sins and my sins righteously, but he was going to judge them in the body of Jesus Christ. He was going to satisfy them. That death sentence. Who his own self, Jesus said here about Jesus. Who Jesus, his own self, bear our sins. What's he talking about? Bearing the penalty of our sins, which was death, in his body on the tree. That we, so that we, being dead to sins, should live under righteousness by whose stripes he were healed. There's a should here. <laughs> and then in 1 Peter 3.18, another great verse of scripture. You should memorize these. Yeah, yeah, you know, uh, Esther and, and uh, Ezra and, and Emerson encourage you to memorize these verses. I memorized them when I was about in my mid-twenties um, sometime then, but I've used them thousands and thousands of times to lead hundreds of people to Christ. Why? Why do I need these verses? Why are they so important? Because they teach the propitiation of God. And I don't believe anyone can believe the gospel if they don't understand what the gospel did, what it accomplished. And that is the propitiation of God. Everything else comes out of that. If you don't understand that doctrine, you can't understand anything else about the gospel, and nor can you explain it. So say Jesus died for our sins, and... Uh, you know, rose from the dead, that, that's all true. But the intent of those words is what did these accomplish? And when we believe, we're believing in what it accomplishes for us. So in verse 18 of 1 Peter 3, it says, For Christ also hath many times suffered for our sins. No, 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 once, once. The just. The sinless one for the unjust, the sinner. That, or so that, he might bring us to God. This is reconciliation. He didn't bring us to God to, to uh, you know, to live in heaven. This is talking about having a relationship with God. The righteous, holy God. So we can have a personal relationship with him. So he brings us to God, reconciliation. And this is our ministry, is to explain this to people. Remember uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5? To wit, the, here, God has given us a ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ Jesus, uh, reconciling the world unto himself. That's our ministry of reconciliation. So we are to explain, not just an escape from hell, but we, propitiation gives us a, a, a relationship, takes us to have this relationship with, with Jesus Christ. So that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. The justification of sinners, that's the 
gift of God kind righteousness in the indwelling Holy Spirit of God is available only because God has been propitiated. Otherwise, nothing else, everything else would be impossible. If, if the death sentence was not satisfied and your sin penalty remitted, by the way, your salvation is dependent upon your remission of the sin penalty, not forgiveness of sin. Forgiveness of sin is only for believers. Once you believe, then you can be restored to fellowship by the same blood that satisfied the wrath of God. You can be uh, restored to fellowship with God by appealing to that once for all sacrifice of Jesus Christ that has already borne the penalty for every sin you've already committed. And, and don't confuse the two. They're two different Greek words in the Bible. So perhaps the best definition and practical application of the doctrine of propitiation is the righteous satisfaction of God's just penalty, which is death, through the substitutionary and vicarious payment of that sin penalty once for all in the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. So God is propitiated when his just penalty, which is death, is satisfied through his judgment, Romans 6, 23, being satisfied. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Look at Romans 6, or Romans 3, 20, excuse me, Romans 3, 25. Now he's talking in this portion of scripture, a dispensational transition. The issue of the sins of the Old Testament believer and the sins now, what happened to those uh, sins, those sins that were passed, and now how it brings it into the new covenant. And it says, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins. That's the remission of the sin penalty. That are passed through the forbearance of God. Now, this is talking about the Old Testament say it was saved on credit and put on layaway. And what that means is that uh, their, their sins had not yet been satisfied by the blood offering of Christ. So it was all on credit. But the credit was sure because God said his son was coming. And so they look forward to that and so all the remission of the sins that are passed. This is not talking about your sins and my sins that are past. Every sin that we ever committed was already in the, in the future when Jesus Christ was crucified. And so he's talking about all the sins that happened before Calvary. So uh, here he came to declare the righteousness of God for the remission of sins that are past through what? The forbearance of God. And the forbearance of God is he, he forbear. He, he bare before. That's the context here. So he says now, to declare, I say at this time, at that, that the new, beginning of the new covenant, that he, God, might be just and the justifier of him. We, we would say, how can God save uh, anyone, you know, really? Uh, the, the whole issue is, how can a just God save a sinner? Well, propitiation is the answer. So he, that's the only way he can be just. The penalty has to be paid. And second, then he, that's the only way he can justify. So he, that he might be both just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. And justification, of course, is the gift of God's uh, kind righteousness. Now I'll come back to 1 John 2, 2, another great portion of Scripture. We're all familiar with it. And here in this context, he is talking to believers so that they can understand this issue of the propitiation of God. And in 1 John 2, 2, he says that he is the propitiation for our sins. Someone says, how do I know that my sins have, the penalty of my sins have been remitted? Because God has been propitiated. So when it says here, he is the propitiation for our sins, this is believers, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. 
Otherwise, the su sacrifice is sufficient enough for all, but beneficial only to those who believe. But he has propitiated God for the sins of the whole world. Universal propitiation. Now, the Calvinists will say, well, if everybody, if Christ died for everybody, then everybody's saved. That's not what it says. No, God's wrath has been satisfied for every sin. But you have to receive that benefit. You have to believe to receive it. Look at chapter 4 and verse 10. We want to know what love is? Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the, the most extreme example of love that we can imagine in the Bible. Christ said it like this, no greater love hath any man than this, that he that lay down his life for his friends. And Romans 5.8. I love Romans 5.8. One of my favorite proportions of scripture in the Bible. Because you know who the us is, I'm one of them. I'm one of the us of Romans 5.8. But God commendeth his love toward us, at sinners. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, this is now this new standing we have in grace, Romans 5, 2, because his blood offering propitiated God's wrath, being now justified by his blood, it is the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. And so it is the blood offering of Jesus Christ that propitiated God's wrath. It required a perfect blood offering a blood where Christ it says he, he by his own blood has done this and then he has justified this, his own blood. There's, there never was any other blood like the blood of Jesus Christ except for when God created Adam. But even that wasn't the same. Because when God, uh, when, when God impregnated Mary, the Spirit of God impregnated Mary, there was God and man in that womb. And that was something completely different. So he says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Now, that's a different wrath. That's a different wrath we're being saved from. That's a wrath that he's going to pour out on this world. That's a wrath of the great white throne. That's your judicial operations of God. You know, we have a basis of law in our court system that says you can't be tried for the same crime that you've been found innocent of uh, twice. If you've been found innocent of a crime, you can't be tried for it again. Same principle. It's a biblical principle. You have been tried and you have been found innocent because Jesus paid your penalty. And now your standing before God in grace is one of perfect perfection. <laughs> Now, I think we've got that foundation laid. So as we come here to chapter 4, and we come and we see John gives us a view of the throne of God in heaven. When you see that throne, what's going to happen? <laughs> when the saints of God come up to that throne, and uh, now we're no longer, we are coming boldly to that throne of grace. That one we only approached in faith now, today. Now we come and we see it. I tell you, there is going to be a hallelujah chorus taking place that day like you can't imagine. And the angels won't even have be able to sing the song of redemption that you'll be able to sing because they don't understand redemption. They, they don't even comprehend why God would do it. But you and I, who know what we are, and we're going to stand before God, we finally see that judicial throne of God and we're going to understand what has happened. As we can approach our heavenly father. And we're going to be singing hallelujah. And the redemption chorus like you can't imagine. What a day that would be. Wouldn't it be great if we get that kind of spirit in the church today? Now let's look at the throne and the significance of the rainbow in verse 3 of Revelation 4. 
Now, that, I talked about this a little bit this morning. The rainbow of Revelation, verse uh, 3, 4, verse 3, extends spherically around the throne. It's not a little arc, it's not two dimensional. It is a sphere, right? It's like you're on the end, the, the throne of God is inside a ball of light. But it's not a little ball of light. I believe, according to Ezekiel's vision, we're going to go over there uh, to Ezekiel chapter 1. According to Ezekiel's vision, this throne may be, may be suspended upon the living creatures themselves. Otherwise, they may be holding this throne up in the air, these cherubim. They may be exalting it. And it appears a whole sea of crystal. Remember, gold, when it is purified to its purest sense, becomes translucent. You can see through it. And so uh, it appears a whole sea of crystal upon which this throne sets is suspended upon the living creatures, these beasts, as a vehicle upon will, wheels. And uh, at least that's the way it seems to be described. Now, when you get there and this isn't what you see, uh, then trust your eyes, not what I say. <laughs> but uh, here in verse 9 of Ezekiel 1. And when the living creatures went, that's these angels, that, uh, these cherubim, that, these beasts that Revelation talks about, living creatures, the wheels went by them. So as they moved, the wheels moved. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, what? The wheels were lifted up. And whithersoever the spirit was to go, they went. Thither was their spirit to go, and the wheels were lifted up over against them. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And what's, he, what's this saying? I, I think what I see here is this is a mechanism by which the throne of God moves, transport, through these uh, angelic beings. Now, when those went, these went, and when those stood, these stood. Otherwise, when the cherubim moved, then the, the, the throne moved. When these stood still, they stood still. And when those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up over against them. Otherwise, they rose up off the earth. For the spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. Now the spirit here, of course, is, a, is, is just the breath or the power it was in these wheels. So there was power in these, uh, angelic power here. And we have no idea what the power of angels are. We don't have any comprehension of it. I do know this, that the Bible says that Michael uh, did not fight with Satan and the other fallen angels. He let the, God take care of that. And that's how powerful they were. They are. And we, we have no comprehension. I guarantee you, you shouldn't be taking them on your own power. Uh, you better be careful about it. And the likeness of the firmament upon the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firm, firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Every one had two, which covered on this, on this side, and every one had two, which covered on that side, their bodies. Otherwise, it was a covering for them. And when they went, I heard the noise of their wings, like the noise of great waters, as the voice of the Almighty, the voice of speech, as the noise of a host. When they stood up, they let down their wings. Somebody once told me, he said, well, this is like a helicopter. They have these helicopters that now the blades can fall down. I said, man, you sure got a short-sighted view of that. Uh, I guarantee you, these aren't helicopters. These are living creatures. And uh, uh, what they're like, we may find some things that are similar to these, but I guarantee you, it's nothing like what we can imagine here in our little minds. So it's going to be noisy when, it, when they uh, start moving around. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads when they stood up and had let down their wings. And above the firmament that was uh, over their heads was a likeness of a throne. So it's above them, right? As the appearance of a sapphire stone, and upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness of the, as the appearance. Now all of these, I want you to underline, as the appearance in your Bible. Because... He's not saying this is what they are, it's what they look like. 
It's as they appeared. He's trying to describe them in the best way he can describe something that's indescribable. And so uh, the appearance, uh, and I saw as the color, as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward. What's he talking about? A sphere of fire, what looked like fire. As the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. So it was like a spherical rainbow that surrounded him but was on fire. <laughs> and yet he could see through it. Now he's just trying to describe it the best he can. So was the appearance of the brightness round about it. What's he talking about? He's talking about the glory of God. It's more than just a bright light. It is a judgment of the righteousness of God. It is righteousness that judges. It is, it is righteousness. Why man cannot look upon the glory of God in his lost estate? He cannot do it because it would destroy him. It is a fire of righteous judgment. And this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. Now it's the likeness of the glory of the Lord. He's trying to describe it. And when I saw it, what's his response? I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. God is speaking. It's apparent that this spherical radiance surrounding the throne like a rainbow is a radiant glory of the almighty God like a giant transparent emerald ball surrounding the throne of God. It's glory that can be seen and perhaps even felt. It exists because God in his, is in his glory upon his throne. When we think about the omnipresence of God, that God is everywhere present, it is the glory of God that fills the universe. Einstein uh, spoke about uh, the cosmological constant. He said there is something in the universe, we don't know what it is, we can't see it, but it is that it is some kind of force that controls everything. I wanted to raise my hand. Mr. Einstein, I know, I know, I know what it is. So did Ezekiel. So did John. So did Isaiah. Now what do the sardine stone, the ruby, and the jasper stone, what do they represent in verse 3? Again, Ezekiel's vision is similar in, in chapter 1, verse 26. We go on with the same text. And above the ferment that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about it within it, from the appearance of his loins even upward, from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire and had brightness round about it. So the appearance of a sapphire stone seen by Ezekiel was like the white sapphire stone and therefore it concurs with John's uh, vision, which he describes as be like a jasper. It's a uh, very white, bright whiteness. We need to remember that these are not so much symbolic uh, as they are the attempts of these men to use known reference items to describe the indescribable almighty God. What would you describe something that is extremely valuable? How would you describe it with great valuable jewels? In both cases, the rainbow and these colors are described by the brilliance of these stones to describe the radiant glory of God uh, emanating from him. I assure you, when you finally see it, you're going to say, yeah, I see it just like it. But it's not like it at all. <laughs> Each aspect re relates to a pure, clear, but visible light. The colors of the rainbow. Do you realize every color known to humanity is in the rainbow? We see just a few uh, there, but actually every color known to humanity Every shade of color that's possible is in the rainbow. And I think that is what God is showing us here. Every aspect, the alpha, the omega, everything that we can imagine is there. It's in the rainbow. 
and that is this glory of God. So I'm sure that these descriptions are inadequate to the reality of God's glory, but they were the very best that man could understand, and it's probably the best we can understand today. Uh, I guarantee you when you get there, you're going to say, wow, those were <laughs> really inadequate descriptions. But if you were a person living in poverty during this particular times and you saw the opulence of what you saw, you would be comparing it to the most uh, opulent things you can imagine. So the breastplate of the high priest of Israel was decorated with 12 precious stones, each representing one of the tribes of Israel. Remember, Moses was to create everything that he saw in heaven, as God gave him a vision, it patterned that in the tabernacle. And so that breastplate of righteousness represented these very same things, and it's in Exodus 28, verse 15. It says, Thou shalt make the breastplate of judgment with cunning work. Otherwise, it's supposed to be very skilled labor. After the work of the ephod that shall make it of gold, of blue, and of purple, this is these many colors that, uh, by the way, these were all uh, very difficult colors to replicate during this particular time, especially when you're out in the desert uh, um, with really no resources. Uh, so they're of, of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet. These were all royal colors. Uh, and a fine twined linen. This is interwoven linen. Uh, linen. Again, uh, most of the clothing was made out of something similar to sackcloth. Very, it's like, um, uh, what do we put a potato, potato bag, you know, uh, what are they called? Burlap. burlap kind of like burlap. That's what sackcloth is like. So, but this was very, inner, very, tightly interwoven linen, the most, the, the most precious that you could get. And uh, uh, thou shalt make it four square, it shall be, it shall be being doubled, uh, so very tight. Uh, a span shall be the length thereof, and a span shall be the breadth thereof. And thou shalt set it in its settings of stone, even four rows of stones. The first row shall be sardius, topaz, and a carbuncle. This shall be the first row. The second row shall be an emerald, a sapphire, and a diamond. The third row, a ligur, an agate, and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx, and a jasper. They shall be set in gold in their enclosings. Otherwise, they should be held in place with gold enclosings. And, uh, of course, all of these, how many tribes of Israel are there? Twelve. How did God set them up around the tabernacle? In groups of three on the four sides. Same thing that we see here. So the first stone was a red ruby. That's a Sardis stone. It represented the tribe of Reuben, the firstborn. It also represents redemption in the promised one. That's the first one. The name Reuben means see a son. And so I don't know who named him, but somebody said, see a son. And uh, they named him Reuben. Genesis 29, 32. And Leah conceived and bare a son. She called his name Reuben. Oh, there we find out who named him. For she said, Surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. Now therefore my husband will love me. Because he wanted a son. So the last stone was a jasper. So the first stone is a ruby. The last stone is a jasper. And it represented the tribe of Benjamin. And the name Benjamin means son of my right hand. And so the, uh, it tells us in Genesis 35, 18, and it came to pass as her soul was in departing, uh, for, for she died, so as she was dying, she named his, uh, she called his name Benanon, but his father called him Benjamin, the son of my right hand. So in Psalm 110, verse 1, it says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Set thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Each of these 12 stones represents an aspect of the character of Christ. And that is, of course, the same in the sons of, uh, of the 12 sons of Israel. It seems apparent that each of these stones is also intended to represent an aspect of the glory of God in his radiance. And since the, the, the ruby is the first and the jasper is the last, 
They represent what Jesus Christ says of himself. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, he says, I am one. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And of course, the intent is in everything in the middle. <laughs> and what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches then, which are in Asia, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. All these seven churches that we find in this book. Revelation 1.11 and Hebrews 1.1 1, uh, 1 through 3. Same truth is there. So, uh, when we look at these things, we're, we're seeing, of course, now, what we only see typically in the Bible. We are seeing John try to describe what Moses saw, what uh, Isaiah saw, what, uh, of course, uh, others like uh, in the Bible, Daniel had these visions. When they saw God, Ezekiel saw these, this vision. They're trying to describe it to us. Why? Why? Because they saw with their eyes what we only see with faith. And, faith. and as they describe it to us, it is the intent that the same things that came to their minds come to our eyes of faith. We should know that these are real things. We have eyewitness accounts of heaven. Eyewitness accounts of heaven. And uh, you and I, we, we see the same vision by faith. Now, we'd have the same difficulty of trying to understand and comprehend it as they did. And try, you know, um, I've always tell people, uh, tell me what eternity is without using the word time. No, you, you can't. We, we have nothing, we have nothing within our language to even communicate that. So, eternity is timeless. Oh, you just use the word time. See? We can't comprehend something that is not within our realm of existence. That what the, that's what these men, all of them throughout the Bible, who got these visions, otherwise they saw, God let them see with their eyes uh, into heaven. And they come back and us describe it to us so we can see it with faith. We, 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 if we saw it, we wouldn't be able to describe it either. But the point is, can you by faith accept it as real? Because if by faith you can, you must accept everything else the Bible says as well. But this righteous God on his throne, so that you and I can go there and, and go to heaven, stand around the throne with God in his presence. The one who said, let there be light. And there was. We just spoke it all into existence. I don't know about you, I'm overwhelmed by it all. It, uh, uh, every time I read uh, these texts uh, here in, uh, in Revelation, in Ezekiel, uh, Isaiah, uh, in uh, Daniel, these great prophecy, I, I move into my wow mode. <laughs> and I say, I look at all of this and I see this being that we know as God. And I went, why in the world would he have anything to do with us? I just, I can't understand that. You know, why not just whoosh and start over? And, and the, the reality is he doesn't want a bunch of robot servants. He could have created robot servants. But he created us with a free will so that we could choose to love him, choose to serve him. Choose to worship him. And we do that every single day of our lives. Oh, we have a wonderful God. Our Father, we thank you so much for the revelation of yourself and of your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we know you love us more than we can possibly imagine. And Lord, we want to love you in some way that might come close, at least something that would be acceptable to you. And Lord, so we open up our hearts to you completely. And we ask that you fill them to the overflowing. We pray for any here or online who are watching and need to be saved, be born again. 
that they could come to know you for who you are and for what you've done for them. What a wonderful grace that you've given us in your Son, Jesus Christ, in his death, burial, and resurrection, that we might be born again into the new Genesis and live eternity with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.